So we have to picture that it's Canada in winter. See, I told you this was going to be easy. <laughs> and you've decided in your generosity to pick up your friend from the airport. So you leave your apartment and you dress appropriately for the conditions. And you arrive at the airport and your friend steps off the plane, but they're dressed in a very light anorak. So they leave the airport and promptly die. <laughs> And you're like, you know, I'm really sorry this has happened, especially because I drove all the way to pick you up from Pearson. But my dude, you're not even wearing pants. <laughs> and the point is that while you found conditions completely habitable because you were wearing the correct clothing, your friend would have found Canada completely uninhabitable due to the fact they were only wearing a light jacket. And similarly, the Earth is also wearing a jacket. More specifically, it's wearing its atmosphere. And its atmosphere controls how much sunlight it needs to have a temperate surface. So what this means is the quality of your jacket will depend on where you're most comfortable. So if you're wearing you know, a thick anorak, you might be good in this orbit. If you have a light jacket, you're going to be nearer, you're going to need to be nearer the sun in order to stay warm. Likewise, if you have a very thick coat, you'll want to be further away or you're going to swelter. But here's the problem. For exoplanets, we can know the mass and the radius, but at the moment, it's very hard for us to know what kind of jackets those planets are wearing. So if we don't know what atmospheric coat they've got on, we actually don't know which orbits are going to be habitable for them. So what do we do? Because we often talk about the habitable zone when it comes to exoplanets. What we're really doing at that point is we're saying it's habitable for the Earth, wearing the Earth's atmosphere. So really, the habitable zone in terms of exoplanets is the Earth's habitable zone. So the first planet that everyone remembers, which is not actually the first planet, I'll come back to that, <laughs> is the one that, of course, the Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, just right. in 1999. And that was 51 Pegasi b. And this was a Jupiter-sized planet. And you might think, well, huh. We've got a Jupiter, they've got a Jupiter, it's all the same, isn't it? Yeah. But this Jupiter has an orbit that is a year that takes just four days, whereas our Jupiter takes 12 years. And Mercury, our innermost planet, still takes mm. 88 days. So four days is ridiculous. I mean, seriously. <laughs> yeah, you'd get nothing uh, done. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, <laughs> think how old you'd be on that planet. Um, and this was amazing because our theory of planet formation actually said this couldn't happen. Uh, you need a lot of material to build a planet the size of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And there just shouldn't be that much material that close to the star. It should just be vaporized. Mm -hmm. So how do you build, you know, an absolutely monstrous planet so incredibly close to the star? Mm. And the conclusion was that you don't, <laughs> and you can't. And actually, we were probably OK with our theory of building those planets in much colder areas where you've got a lot more building material. Right. But then once they formed, they can actually change orbits. And this is known as migration. Oh, and the wow. idea actually wasn't new. It had been proposed in the 1980s where people had done these theoretical calculations and said, oh, you know, when the planet is new mm -hmm. and it's still embedded in this uh, natal disk of dust and gas that it formed from, mm -hmm. that gas can drag the planet and pull it inwards. But then they looked at our solar system and didn't see a lot of evidence for this. Mm -hmm. So it was concluded maybe it wasn't important. Maybe the planets form late enough. That disk is almost dispersed. Mm -hmm. or maybe some other force just stops this happening. But then we discovered what were, you know, imaginatively named hot Jupiters because... I mean, the, the Jupiters and the hot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we realized that actually in many systems, this migration idea is a huge architect of planetary systems. And until the start of the 1990s, these were all the planets that we knew. We didn't really think they were the only ones that existed, but we couldn't see any evidence of planets around other stars until our telescopes became good enough. However, before the 1990s, a wobble was detected around uh, with a star called Gamma Zephy. And Gamma Zephy was moving very slightly to and from the direction of the Earth, looking like it was making a very small orbit. 
And it was proposed that this wobbling motion might be due to an unseen, much smaller body whose gravity was making a very gentle tug on that star and causing that wobble. So could this have been an exoplanet detection? Well, there were some problems. The first was that Gamma Zephi was not alone in the sky. This star was part of a binary system, meaning there were actually two stars orbiting one another. Now, our sun doesn't have a binary companion, so the first skepticism was, well, can you even form planets if you've got like two stars rather than one? And the second problem was that Gamma Zephi itself was a giant star. Now, these are stars that are approaching the end of their life. And as they get quite old, these stars get a bit cantankerous. And that means their outer atmosphere has a lot of pulsations and vibrations that could look uh, just like a wobble from an unseen planet. So the astronomers sum this up in the light late 1980s and concluded that yes, they had seen this wobble, but they decided it was unlikely to be a planet. And when they made that statement, they actually missed discovering the first exoplanet, because this wobble was due to a planet, but it wasn't confirmed until about 2013. So what we're saying is the habitable zone is more like a searching zone for finding possible habitable planets, as opposed to offering any guarantee that a planet within the habitable zone will in fact be habitable. Absolutely, yes. Now, based on what Aki said about how it has to be like this warm region around the star, um, I think we've assumed Earth-like conditions for changing that radiation the planet's receiving at that campfire point to what the surface conditions will be like. Uh, so that means that the surface conditions on the planet, if they're not like Earth, could be quite different. So what do we know currently about surfaces of these exoplanets? Approximately nothing. <laughs> so one of the questions we need to ask is, how did the Earth become habitable? That is, if we were to form the Earth again in the habitable zone, will we definitely get a habitable planet? And to understand the answer to that, we need to go back in time and look about what happens when the sun was forming. So young stars, including the young sun, are surrounded by a disk of dust and gas. And we've seen this in reality too. This is a whole series of disks that have been observed with ALMA, the submillimeter radio telescope. And so we know that most young stars do indeed start off with uh, disks of dust and gas in which planets can form. So in this disk, we start off with microscopic grains, and these slowly collide and stick and build bigger and bigger objects until eventually you get something that looks like a planet. Now there is a subtlety here. You'll be unsurprised to know that if you are forming close to a newly born star, you're going to be a lot hotter than if you're forming further away. And this means that at some point, it's going to be cold enough that water can solidify into ice. And this point is known as the ice line. So if you're forming inside the ice line, water is a vapor in this region, and so you'll form out of predominantly dry grains. However, if you are forming your planet outside the ice line, ices can join in that building process and you can get a lot more water into the system. So if we form here, we expect basically a desert world, a dry planet without water. And if we form here, you should get something with a truck, truckload of water. But here's the mystery. We think the Earth formed here, inside the ice line, where there shouldn't have been a lot of water. And yet, although we don't have a lot of water by mass, the majority of our surface is covered with liquid. So how did the Earth become a habitable planet? And we don't have a fixed answer, but we do have some ideas. And so, Elizabeth you know, what was the reaction when you saw that email the first time, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I want to talk to you, but I want to fictionalize you. I mean, that's an interesting, that hasn't happened to me. I mean, that must be an interesting moment. I mean, I'm very disappointed, Ria, that you wrote out the flat, the flat male <laughs> astrophysicist and fired him. I can't imagine why. But uh, so Elizabeth, what was it like? So I, I'd like to also draw on another point that Ria said, that she was basically prefers flawed characters. So she got rid of her male <laughs> astrophysicist. <laughs> I was like, this person, my goodness, they're there. <laughs> A flawed astrophysicist, this is what I need. It has to be Elizabeth. 
So until this moment, I was feeling pretty good about it. Now, slightly less so. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was it was amazing. I mean, I saw the email and I was like, sign me up. This has to be great. I mean, who doesn't want immortality? Um, well, I'm not sure actually in reality whether I'd like immortality, but in fiction, I'd be like, I could live forever in this book. Uh, so I was like, absolutely sign me up. And I was actually pretty flexible about how Rhea portrayed me. She had a story to tell. I wasn't a key character. I'm waiting for the spin-off novel for that one where I become the key character. Um, but, you know, I, I was a... I was a plot assist for her. So, you know, she she asked me some questions and I, I gave her answers, but I was really prepared to shrug my shoulders and say, you know, sure, I'd like superpowers, but you do what you have to do. Um, <laughs> so what I was actually very surprised about is when Rhea sent me back um, the parts where she'd written me in, how much it actually sounded like me. In fact, it was slightly disconcerting because I felt I hadn't provided all that much information. And really, this could have been a really taken verbatim from one of my talks and the question and answer afterwards. Uh, in particular, near the end, um, the lead character in uh, Rhea's novel is a 17 year old called Grace. And she goes to one of my talks. And afterwards, she comes up and talks to me because we'd, we communicated over email. And she's like, hi, I'm Grace. And I'm like, lovely to meet you. And, you know, Grace is someone who really wants to be an astrophysicist. And she sort of talks to my character about this and my character gives her honestly slightly cynical advice which is to say this is a wonderful goal but you know you're 17 keep your options open and it's not really designed to be cynical it's basically to say there are so many opportunities don't close your mind to other things that might come your way just because you have your heart currently set on being an astrophysicist there might be something even better out there for you